right, good morning. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. That's what I like to hear. Um, I want to start in a little bit different way. Uh, I sit on the board for an organization called 127 Worldwide, who we support. It's a nonprofit organization. Uh, the Great Commission includes our Jerusalem, which is right here. We want to impact Barbersville and the community surrounding us. We want to impact our state. We want to impact uh, locally. We also want to have a global impact as well. And what 127 Worldwide is doing is making that possible in ways that don't hurt, right? Have you ever seen like maybe a mission trip that goes in and just paints the same buildings every year? And maybe there's other ways that sometimes global missions can actually undercut economies and undercut uh, the ways that people are doing life in other countries. And it actually hurts worse than it, more than it helps. 127 is counteracting that in ways of educating people this side, so educating the church on what it looks like to do mission, and then mobilizing mission in places like Kenya, Uganda, Guatemala. So yesterday we had our annual in-person board meeting in Raleigh, and we spent roughly eight hours just planning out the vision for the next three years, and there's super exciting stuff coming. And so as we partner with that organization financially, we don't want it to be only that. And so be looking for some stuff coming up in the next few months where we announce some of the things that they're doing and look for ways that we can participate in the mission uh, from here. And then also there'll be go teams next year for the first time since COVID hit. So if any of you are itching, I know this isn't everybody's jam, but if any of you are itching to go on a mission trip, a healthy mission trip to Guatemala or Uganda or Kenya. There'll be opportunities for that in 2023. So uh, stay tuned for that information. Anyway, we love 127 Worldwide, the work that they're doing for the sake of the gospel um, all over the world. What do we have? I don't have my, I don't have my order of worship. I'm just flying up here. What's the, what are we, help me out. There we go. Thanks. Who says I'm supposed to have it all together? This is our vision for Mercy Village Church. This is what we want to look like from 50,000 feet, if you will. A group of people saved by Jesus to walk with Jesus. Not just for one day and not by ourselves, but together in worship towards our neighbor to the ends of the earth throughout generations for all our days. We thought hard about those words when we put that together. Every one of them matters in that vision statement. This is what we want to look like as, as a church. A couple announcements, and again, I'm going to trust the slides as they rotate through here. We have a membership class uh, coming. Now, we did it in one night uh, just this past Monday. We're going to do it in just two Sundays this next time. Um, I've kind of, I guess, learned to stop talking so much. It's probably maybe the, one of the helpful things. So we'll be able to do it in two Sundays. It'll be about a 45-minute class, two Sundays in a row. So it'll be October the 9th and then again on October the 16th. You have to come We come to both or we'll videotape one. You can kind of come to one and watch the video of the other. But it is a two-part class. So the classes won't be the same. They'll build on, on each other. So if you're looking to become a member of Mercy Village Church, that's the, one of the prerequisites for that. We have a sign-up in the lobby at the Connect desk, and then you can sign up online as well. I'll share a link for that this week. Uh, that's coming up. And then do I have anything else? Thanks. No, that's it? All right. <laughs> Man, pray for me. What is a Christian? These are books that this is a challenge that we're wanting to do with our families here at Mercy Village Church. It starts this week. Now, again, you can go through this book your own time this week, but this week's first section is on the topic of God, which is like not a big topic, just kidding, uh, massive topic, but there's five different activities in this book that you can go through, and it's geared towards like elementary school age kids, maybe young middle school age kids. These are free, they're sitting on the Connect desk. We do ask that if you have more than two kids, please only take two of them, and just find a way to keep everybody from fighting e with each other while you go through them, just so that we make sure we have enough for everybody. 
uh, for the next eight weeks, we want to be going through this as families. It's your own accountability on your own time, uh, in your own way, but this is just a challenge so that we as parents can be stewarding the opportunity that we have to be discipling and investing in our own children. When you think about making disciples in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth, for parents, for guardians, you have an opportunity to not even walk out of your front door and already be on mission, investing in your children with the truth of the, of the gospel. So those are on the back Connect Desk. We would love for you to take one of those home and get started with your family this week. And there's eight sections. We're just going to do one section a week over the next eight weeks. It's all pretty self-explanatory in that book. You don't have to be a school teacher or anything to, to walk through that. Um, anyway, let's pray. So bow your heads. Kind of shut things out for just a second. I know even the fact that I forgot my little notes up here. didn't even know what we were doing. I'm, there's maybe reasons that you're flustered, reasons for chaos, reasons for churning in your hearts. We're going to get quiet for just 20 seconds. It's going to feel like an eternity to some of us. We're just going to be quiet for 20 seconds, and then I'm going to pray for us. So just in that stillness, quietly in your hearts, speak to Jesus. Father, in the silence, in the quietness of our hearts, please still them. Give us peace. Rest, a posture of openness to what you have for us today. It will be unique to each and every one of us, what you have for us. In its application. But in its essence, it will be the same Jesus. The truth of the gospel. Bring those truths to light for us today in your good grace. Make yourself known to us in fresh and exciting and in beautiful ways. And might our lives be changed for the better by your good grace. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. If you are thirsty for something this life cannot give you, this is the place for you. If you have nothing left to give, this is the place for you. If you're seeking something to fill the void, this is the place for you. Isaiah 55, 1 through 2 and verse 6. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Come weary, come broken, come burdened, come thirsty. We welcome you. Amen. Will you stand with us? Welcome to Mercy Village Church. My name is Josh, one of the pastors here. If you're new with us today, uh, we welcome you. We begin our service singing songs of truth, uh, reminding them ourselves of what Jesus has done for us, what God has done, how he has made a way for us to come into his presence. So today as we sing, we lift our voices together and we proclaim the truth of the gospel with joy. Come on church, let's sing. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. The prodigal is welcomed home, the sinner now the same. For the God who died come back to life, and everything has changed. Hallelujah. 
Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Come on, church. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you and delivered and redeemed. Eternal life is ours. Oh, praise his name forever. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And all throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And on the day you call me in to heaven's sweet embrace, and I see the scars you roll arms, the beauty of your face. And through tears of joy, I lift my voice in everlasting praise. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, fear, where is your power? The mighty King of kings has disarmed you, delivered and redeemed, eternal life is ours, oh praise his name forever, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave, hallelujah, Christ is risen from the grave. All throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. And all throughout eternity, our song will be the same. Hallelujah. Christ is risen from the grave. alive today. That's why we are here. That's why we're gathered together because Jesus has defeated sin and death. And he's alive today at the right hand of the Father. And so we were reminded of that today as we sing these songs. Thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, and call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above praise the mountain fix upon it the mount of thy redeeming love and here I raise my Ebenezer hither by thy help I've come and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. And Jesus sought me with a stranger, wandering from the throne of God. And he to rescue me from danger. 
Savior interposed his precious love. And oh, to grace, how great a debtor and daily I'm constrained to be. And let thy goodness like a fair find my wandering heart to thee and prone to wonder lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love and here's my heart lord take and seal it seal it for thy courts above all I adore your name. Sing above, above all else. Tune my heart to sing your praise. Sing it again. Above all else, I adore your name. Above all my heart to sing your praise. Come on, church, let's sing. Above all else, I adore your name. Above all else, tune my heart to sing your praise. Above to leave the God I love. And here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Psalm 51 reminds us Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. It's the blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And that is our hope today. It's Jesus' righteousness, not ours. And when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. And when the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. And I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path. For my love is often cold, and he will hold me fast. And he will hold me fast, and he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast. Think about these words as we sing. Those he saves are his delight. Christ will hold me fast. 
precious in his holy side he will hold me fast and he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last but by him at such a cost and he will hold me fast and he will hold me fast and he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so he will hold me fast and for my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. And raised with him to endless life. And he will hold me fast. Until our faith is turned to sight. When he comes at last And he will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so And he will hold me fast Oh, he will hold me fast Come on church will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Let's do that chorus one more time Come on, every voice And He will hold me fast he will hold me fast for my Savior loves me so. He will hold me fast. Heavenly Father, thank you today that we can come before you. That you've made yourself known to us. You've made a plan for us to come back to you because of Jesus, his life, his death. We are no longer separated by sin. We can come into your presence today with thankful hearts, with joyful hearts, God, because you've made yourself known to us. And not only do we know you, but most importantly, you know us. Even in our sin, the worst days that we would have, you knew us and you love us anyway. And we're grateful for that today. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, kids. Are dismissed. We worship the God who is. We worship the God. Let each of you look not only to the, his own interest, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, whom, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but it emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has exalted him above, exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we say together, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. We live in a world where self-centeredness is the air we breathe. It's always been that way, in a sense. But I do feel like things like social media have maybe made it more obvious how interested in 
itself so many of us are prone to be? Is this something that, that tends to happen to all of us? Now, I have a quote from C.S. Lewis, because I want to help all of us feel the need for this today. Not just to point, like to kind of deflect to the person who's boisterously uh, has a big ego and they just brag on themselves all the time. C.S. Lewis says that true humility is not thinking less of yourself, but thinking of yourself less, like frequency, less frequently thinking about yourself. You see, like, woe is me, and I'm not making light of pain, but woe is me can even be a self-centered thought. It can be, right? I'm not saying that mourning and grief are wrong. Nobody tweet that out of here. Does anybody tweet anymore? <laughs> is that even a thing? <laughs> but what I am saying is that arrogance, ego, Pride, self-centeredness doesn't always present itself boisterously, right? Pounding of the chest, although that's increased as well. I can't even watch NFL football anymore. I can't. I'm lying. But it's like you just gained three yards, right? Do we have to act like we just won the Super Bowl? I mean, I'm, I'm proud of you like I am. I hope your parents, you know, your parents are proud of you too. But I mean, just let's act like we've been there before, but that's curmudgeonly. I get it. But it's almost like being a a fish in water. You don't really notice the water. And because of the way society and, and culture is, sometimes we don't even notice. I don't even notice how self centered I'm becoming, how mindful of my own preferences, my own ways, my own thoughts, my own desires I've become. Paul's going to push back against that today, but in a way that actually, in the end, although it's convicting and should be, it should make us feel a little unsettled and a little uneven, it is all, uh, ultimately going to push us to Jesus in a way that comforts our hearts, even when we fail to be others-focused. We had a question last week that I posed. What, what would those close to you say drives you? What would those close to you say you're living for. I'll change it up just a little bit this week. That came out of Philippians 127, which called us to, if, if it was interpreted extremely literally, to live out your citizenship, your heavenly citizenship in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Those of you who are Christians, you're citizens of heaven. We're, we're citizens of the kingdom of God. And we talked last week like West Virginia citizens smell like pepperoni rolls, right? They sound like country roads by John Denver, right? We, we smell, sound, look a certain way. Citizens of the kingdom of God are to smell, sound, look a certain way. Last week we saw unity as one of those marks. That's what kingdom citizens look unified. Kingdom citizens look courageous. Kingdom citizens are people who are, who are coming to a right view of suffering, And this week, kingdom citizens are people who are marked by humility. That's what we look like, smell like, sound like, is is humility. So the question I would ask this week is, would those close to you say that you're living for yourself or that you're living for others? Would they say you're living for yourself or living for others? By God's grace, how's this? We're just driving right to the point. By God's grace, we need to get into Jesus and get over ourselves. That's the message for today. Father, what we know not today, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please give us, namely humility and response to the humility of Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Verses 1 and 2, we're moving into chapter 2 of Philippians today. Letter to the saints at Philippi, written in the early 60s A.D., an ancient letter written to some people in the midst of difficult times by a man, the Apostle Paul, in the midst of difficult times. He himself was in prison when he wrote this letter. He starts in these first two voices laying the seedbed for humility. Verse 1 
It says, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection in sympathy, this is your standard rhetorical question, by the way. And he's not questioning whether those things exist. Of course those things exist in Christ. There is encouragement in Christ. He's not questioning if it exists. It's a rhetorical question. Is there any comfort in love? Of course there is in the love of Christ. And the, there's participation. The Holy Spirit is at work in our lives because of Jesus. Yes, that's reality. There is affection and sympathy among the people of God because of Jesus. Yes, these things exist. What he's doing instead is, is he's calling kind of the two things. We talked about this last week at the end of the sermon. He's kind of saying, test your citizenship. In you, Christian, in you, saints at Philippi, is there encouragement in the things of Christ? Like, is that like is the truth of the gospel growing more and more encouraging to your heart over time? Is that a reality in your life? Test your citizenship, because for a citizen of the kingdom of God, that's a reality. There'll be there'll be comfort in Christ. There'll there will be uh, all of those things. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit, affection and sympathy, encouragement, test your citizenship. Another thing he's doing, it right, as he as like the second piece of that, is if you self-assess, you test your citizenship. And again, this isn't a call to perfection. Like, man, every time I sing about the gospel, man, I just weep because I'm so encouraged, right? Like, Again, like, because we're Appalachian, many of us, we've got some legalism in our past. We like to just really hold ourselves maybe to this high standard. Uh, self-deprecation is a language of, of Appalachia sometimes. So I'm not like saying like uh, that you've got to be perfect in these things. That's not the measure. But are you growing towards these things? That's the test of citizenship. And then if you are, the reality is this. Only Christ can make you like Christ. So if, when you look at your life, if you see, yeah, this behavior in my life, by God's grace, looks, smells, sounds like the kingdom of God. Jesus did that. That means you belong to God and Christ. Rest in that reality. That's what Paul's doing from the beginning. Like he's laying a seedbed, a resting place in this reality because he's going to call you to humility. And when he does, it's going to be an otherworldly, countercultural, difficult call. And if you're like, well, I can pull that off by myself, right? You're just setting yourself up for struggle. You're setting yourself up for guilt. You're setting yourself up for failure. But if you realize, I'm going to lean into Christ, and he's there for me. He's available to me because of the finished work of Jesus on the cross. God calls me his child, and he is working all things together for my good. And he's going to finish the work that he started in me. Then you can strive for humility from a place of resting in the seedbed the seedbed of the gospel. He throws us back to another thing, though, in verse 2, to last week. He says, not only, not only does... Um, well, let me read it first. Complete my joy, he says, by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. That's the same similar language to what he used last week when he says same mind, same love, full accord, one mind. He's talking about unity. So this is the second time he's talked about unity in this kind of what's it look like. And that, that that's why I want to pause there for a second, because if you mention it twice, right, it's important. Unity is a mark of kingdom citizenship. He said it last week and now he says it again. So you can't blow past unity and that matters. And, and, and while it's not the main point, humility is the main point we're getting at this week. Unity matters it does and, and and humility can only come in a place of unity it can only come from that place so might we be people who desire unity might we not be okay with backbiting slanderous gossip like might we never be okay with those things might we not be okay with unnecessary division are there times where Topics and, and uh, things are so important that you might have to part ways with somebody. Possibly. Do we do that way too fast in our current world? Yes. Way too fast. We divide over 
way too many things, way too quickly. So might we value unity? Might we hold fast to it? And, and might it not only be something that we hold fast to, but Paul says, that's what's going to make me happy. You will make me joyful, he says, is unity amongst the people of God. Might it be, be our joy as well? When we see brothers and sisters in Christ dwelling in unity, might that make us, make us happy? So that's the seedbed for humility. It's got to be rooted in the realities of the gospel or it's not going to work. And now he calls you and me to it. He says, do nothing, nothing, right? Like he doesn't say like the behaviors that I'm about to call out are okay in certain situations. Never okay. What I'm about to tell you, never okay. Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit. You have one of those ESV journals or a new uh, copy, newer copy of the ESV Bible. This is as old as the hills, if you couldn't tell. Duct tape Bible. Um, it says selfish ambition, which is a great translation. So you got, right, so what English translators are doing, and you didn't come to hear this, but they're taking Greek, it was written, uh, written in Greek originally, and they're taking and finding the best, most readable way for us English, American English speakers to understand what it was originally said. And so there's decisions made sometimes, like one Bible might say rivalry, one Bible might say uh, selfish ambition. They're getting at that one Greek word that's maybe difficult to wrap our brains around. And so to know that both of those help define the word is helpful. Selfish ambition, rivalry, competitiveness. Okay, Not on the ball field per se. That can be healthy, but right like in all the stuff. And again, this is the air we breathe even if we don't recognize it. You, you potentially want your social media feed to be something because there's a part of you that is jealous of someone else or envious of someone else. I said you. I should have said we. Me as well. It's reality for us. The, the competitiveness, this rivalry, this selfish ambition, does it's not just showing up in sports, right? It's like in all areas of our life, it can manifest itself. So he says, do nothing, not a single thing from selfish ambition, from, from rivalry or conceit. Conceit is a great word in Greek. I'll stop talking about Greek, I promise. But it's this mashup of two words, like two words thrown together into one that literally mean wasted glory. Selfish desire, conceit for yourself, that's wasted glory because there's only one worthy of glory, God himself. So when you live your life for your own glory, it's wasted. That's the point he's making. That's conceit. When you desire your 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 own glory. So instead, that's what he says, do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but instead in humility, count others more significant of higher value than yourselves. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. That's the call. There's a negative part to it. Let rivalry, selfishness, conceit die. Replace them, right, with consideration of others more superior than yourself, with an interest in other people's interests. This exhortation is otherworldly, and we're going to come back to that as we apply this to our lives. We're going to come back to the fact that this is, this is not a normal way of living. What I want us to just own right now, and and again, why I started where I started, is that I hope you can own the difficulty of the call to humility. Like no matter what your personality is, that you're not excluded from the difficulty of humility. It manifests itself in a thousand different ways. Lack of humility, conceit, rivalry, selfish ambition. And so it's really easy for us to act like somebody else might be more arrogant than me, that somebody else might be more selfish than me. And what I hope is happening as we hinge into looking at the example of humility, which is Jesus, that you're owning your own stuff, not somebody else's. 
You're looking at your own call to humility and and realizing it is a difficult call to be humble. In fact, we can't do it, and that's why the passage has this culmination of great news. He says in verse 5, he says, here's the example. So if you look at 1 and 2, you see the seedbed for humility. 3 and 4 is encouragement towards humility. And in verse 5 through 11, he's going to give us the example of humility. And he says, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. There's good news in that short sentence. He says, if you belong to Jesus, then what I'm about to describe to you is yours by default. Jesus in you means this mind is in you. So when you're arrogant, when I'm arrogant, when I'm self-centered, I'm actually acting like the old man, not the new man. Because inside of me is a transformation that has taken place, which means the example we're about to see, the power, the ability, the desire, the want for it has been placed inside of me through Jesus Christ. It's mine. It's yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind in yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus isn't clinging on to power. He's not clinging on to influence. He's not clinging on to comfort. He's willing to let go of those things for the sake of others. Thank God. You don't go to the cross looking for comfort. You don't go to the cross looking for influence. You don't go to the cross looking for power. That's That's not found at the cross. And so he lets those things go. Verse 7, but made himself nothing, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus in all of his cosmic power put on flesh, dwells among us. Jesus, epic in existence, massive in measurement, puts on flesh and dwells among us. Verse 8, And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It's a Christmas song, but we can get get with the Christmas spirit early, right? Have you ever heard this one by Chris Rice? This is a few of the lyrics. This is old. It's an old song. But in there, he sings these lyrics of the incarnation, Jesus coming to this earth to be born as a child, fragile finger right in that little baby hand, Fragile finger sent to heal us, tender brow prepared for thorn, tiny heart, hear this, whose blood will save us unto us is born. So wrap our injured flesh around you, breathe our air and walk our sod, rob our sin and make us holy, perfect son of God. Welcome to our world. Paul calls us to humility. He points us to Jesus. And he points us to the incarnation. John, when he starts his gospel, says, in the beginning was the Word. He's talking about Jesus. And the Word was with God. Jesus was with God. And Jesus was God. Jesus was God. That As he goes on describing it, he says that Jesus was there when everything was created. Nothing exists without his voice. All the cosmic power in the universe in Jesus. Massive. I mean, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator and sustainer of all things. Now, I'll date myself with this, but remember when Aladdin, remember this great epic film? Aladdin at the end, and if this is a spoiler for you, come on. (laughs) What are you doing? He tricks Jafar into wishing to be a genie. You with me? Okay, and when he does, he like he's there, like he's got all these planets. He's like juggling them in his hands. And, and Aladdin says, all the cosmic power in the universe. And then he holds up that lamp and Jafar just sucks back into it and he says, itty bitty living space. Listen. That's the incarnation times a billion. The power of God in a baby. You talk about humility, right? To leave his throne, worship, to come to this earth, all the fullness of God, hear me, in a fetus, growing 
inside of a young girl. Pushed out of a human. If you've ever witnessed the birth, right? That's humble. In a barn. In the hay. Unable to feed himself. Unable to walk. Unable to talk. The sustainer of all life. Nursing from his mother just to stay alive. Like that should blow your mind. And it should never cease to blow our minds. This is what Paul points to. This God who puts our injured flesh on him and comes and walks this earth. Who sweats, who bleeds, who gets thirsty, who cries. That should never cease to blow our minds. And he he didn't just humble himself, Paul says, to becoming a living and breathing human. He humbles himself to become a dying human human he dies on the cross cursed is him that hangs on the tree and he redeemed us from the curse by becoming the curse and watch what happens next our last verses 9 through 11 this is the result therefore god has highly exalted him and bestowed on him a name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the happy ending. But hear me. And this is free. This isn't even in the notes. Notice the timing of the reward. It comes after the suffering. It comes after the pain. It comes after the struggle comes after the blood and the sweat and the tears. That's when the reward comes. And the apostles will point to this time and time again for the children of God, because, you know, as a child of God, there's a there's reward laid up for you in heaven as well. It's no small thing. Like eternity, you can't fathom it. That's that's and I can't fathom it is why we're not just drooling over it. Like if we understood the epic nature of eternity with God, we would just be longing with every fiber of our being to be there right now, just like Paul was in chapter 1. That's waiting for you. But hear me today, it might not come. The reward doesn't always come in the timing we want it to come, but we can trust God's definition of reward is infinitely better than ours and His timeline for reward is always perfect. But here's why it matters, all of this. And this is where, Lord willing, by God's grace, it gets personal for you today. The Holy Spirit has to do that work in your life. I can't. I don't know everyone's unique circumstances. But what Jesus, or what Paul does, is points us to Jesus. He says, look at the incarnation. Look at the crucifixion. This is the power of humility. Like humility is not just an acute characteristic. It is a powerful, world-changing reality. And he says, do you see what happened with Jesus? The incarnation, the crucifixion, that's the gospel. You're here today because of the humility of Jesus. If you're a Christian, your soul has been bought through the price of Jesus' blood, right? Right? Because of the humility of Jesus. We were separated from God by our sins. Jesus paid the price on the cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's what humility purchased for you. Power. And the the end results are powerful. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And hear me to say this today too. Everyone will bow the knee to Jesus, according to this book. Everyone. Those who choose to bow the knee to Jesus in this life will spend eternity in heaven with God. Those who wait because they refuse to bow the knee to Jesus in this life, they're going to bow anyway, but their end is destruction. If you're not a Christian, bow the knee to Jesus today. 
received his humble sacrifice on your behalf as a free gift from God through faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And enter in to a life with Jesus. If you are a Christian, two points of application. The first, get over yourself. How do you like that? Thought long and hard about that. The practical steps towards this were clearly spelled out in verses 3 and 4. Be of the same mind, have the same love. These are unity pieces, be in full accord. These hum- humility pieces avoid selfish ambition and conceit. Count others more significant than yourself. Seek the interest of others. But if you put it simply, it's just that. Get over yourself. I say that harshly. And I certainly don't say that from a place of superiority. I think of myself way, way, way too much. You can ask the people in my life. They see it firsthand. All the time. But I say it with deep, fervent passion. That that's the trajectory we all should be on is letting go of that self, those selfish desires, seeking humility. So just think about a couple things, and I can't give a thousand examples, but these maybe will get your mind turning. What do you do with the balance of your time? Do you spend it for yourself? Or do you spend it for others and for the sake of the kingdom? What do you do with the balance of your money you spend it for yourself or for the for others in the kingdom what do you do with your preferences do you lay them down for the sake of others in the kingdom or do you cling to them what are your motives on social media are you thinking of yourself or others in the kingdom we could go on and on a thousand things Trusting the Holy Spirit to do the work in your heart. That's work of self-examination. But don't leave out like good things either. Like self-care, I'm for that. But are you practicing self-care? The name's confusing. For yourself? Or for others? For the kids, right? Like, are you being filled back up in whatever your version of self-care is? Are you being filled back up so you can pour into others and into the kingdom? Or are you just filling yourself up for yourself? I'm asking myself these questions. Even your engagement at church, believe it or not, can be for yourself. In a sense of like, here to be seen. Here to have my needs met, only my needs met. Come here to have your needs met. Because Jesus meets your needs. But if your only reasons to be here are for yourself, right, even that can turn into a a selfish thing. Man, Paul, you're so convicting. I hope it's convicting. I I want it to be. It has been for me. This is a countercultural call. God's design is not for you to be at the center of the universe. You can't handle that. That should be relieving to you. You don't need to be at the center of your universe. Only God belongs there. God alone is worthy of that place. So, So get over yourself. I want to say this too. Some of y'all have been burned by being selfless and humble. I'm I'm actually... I I talk with a therapist once every two weeks on Zoom for some church wounds in my past. Maybe that's even where your selflessness has been taken advantage of is is in the church. So I don't say lightly, get over yourself. I'm dealing, working through some of my own wounds right now, deep ones. And a piece of that has been, and this is some of us, selflessness has become our identity, right? Right? I'll serve, I'll serve, I'll serve, I'll serve, I'll serve. And in some weird way, this is my story, our selflessness got turned to selfishness because we are now martyrs for the sake of the kingdom. In our own minds, this is who I am. I'm the one who lays down my preferences, lays down my rights, lays down my desires, and eventually that becomes, look at me. And then when nobody notices, 
things go bad. And it doesn't mean my wounds aren't real, but a piece of that was my own. Twisting of selflessness. Lean into the gospel. This is our only hope. Fast forward to next week. This is a sneak peek. Verse 13, chapter 2. I'm hurrying. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. That's coming next week. So when you think about, okay, I want to be humble, or maybe I don't want to be humble, ask God to give you that desire. That's what he says. It's God who works in you both the will and the working for his good pleasure. If you want to do the right thing, it has to be God that works that inside of you. And if you're going to have the ability to do the right thing, it's going to be God who works that inside of you. So if you want to be, if you don't even want to be humble, ask God for that desire. And if you want to be humble, but you don't feel like you can, ask God for that ability. And when you fail, which I have this week multiple times, remember the incarnation and the crucifixion, the perfect humility of Jesus. Remember the nearness of God and repent. Not because God's standing over you with a club, but because God's standing there with open arms to welcome you. Repent of your selfishness. Repent of your lack of humility and receive the forgiveness of God. And God, and let's get after it again together as the people of, of God. For the glory of God and for our joy. I have a vision. Not like a I'm not a vision like I had a vision. Um, but I have a vision of a people of God, Mercy Village Church, moving out into the world around us with starkly obvious humility. How beautiful would that be if in all the places we live and work and play, we displayed the selflessness and the humility of Jesus? It wouldn't be easy. You might get trampled a few times along the way. But it'd be a beautiful representation of the realities of the gospel. When I pray for this church, that's probably within the top four or five things that I pray for. So we'll be people marked by selflessness and humility. Might God make it so. By God's grace, might we be people who get so deeply into Jesus that we have no choice but to get over ourselves. That will be a powerful witness. God, thank you so much for your kindness and for your example through your son Jesus of humility. Might we not be, might we not see it as an overwhelming call? Might we see it as a irresistible opportunity to walk with Jesus in the way of Jesus? So humble us. Might we think of ourselves less might we live our lives for you more? And might every facet of our lives begin to reflect that? Slow growth, for me, it has been. I, I, this type of thing doesn't happen overnight for most of us, maybe for some. But in that long journey in the, in the direction of, of humility and obedience, give us perseverance and strength and ongoing repentance and, and uh, perseverance to keep doing the selfless things, and the humble things. All by your grace and for your glory. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. So we're going to move into a time of communion together. Uh, if you're new with us, this is a weekly uh, response that we have to uh, the Word of God. We, we don't do altar call here, but we do observe uh, the Last Supper uh, as a way to be reminded that Jesus has uh, given his his life, uh, his blood for us. And so we do this together as family. Um, today, uh, we'll, we'll hand this out on the side. Uh, Pastor Paul and I will, will hand this out, and then we will take the meal together at the end. Um, and we do this uh, as a reminder of what Jesus has done. Uh, and so today, I'm going to read the, the scripture first, and then we'll play a song, uh, and then we will take communion together says in Mark 14, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. 
And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And so we do this today as family. If you're not a believer, you can just observe the body of Christ as we take this meal together. Or you can trust Jesus today and take this meal for the first time with us. thinking earlier before uh, before we did this we sing as an act of worship uh, we do many things within our gathering we give money as an act of worship this is also an act of worship that we do together uh, and so this is celebration this is a symbol of Christ's body that was broken for us and this is a symbol of Christ's blood that was shed for us Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you today that you have made a way for us to to be with you forever. As, as we um, take this meal today, God, we're reminded of Jesus, his selfless sacrifice for us. I pray that, uh, that this never gets old, that we that we are always stirred up by the reality and truth that that we were enemies with you. And because of Jesus and his life, his death and his righteousness, we're covered by his blood. We are saved and we will be with you forever. God, that, that hope, that reality, that truth, um, you have proclaimed that. And so we trust you that, that the faith that you've given us, God, will, will take us to the day of completion, that one day we will see you face to face, all because of Jesus. We will be welcomed into your presence forever. God, we thank you for what you're doing in the village. Thank you for this church, this body of believers with many different gifts that you're using for your glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're a parent to young kids, grab one of these on the way out. They're at the Connect desk. We're going to try to go through this over the next eight weeks. And then uh, if you're new, there's Connect cards. If you want, we've got these little tumblers with our logo on them. And then there's like a gift card in there to the human being. Um, if you fill out one of those connect cards at the connect desk, there should be somebody there that can hand you one of those cups just as a, a gift and a thank you for, for being with us. This is our benediction as we close. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. You're dismissed.